Thanks. I was lucky I did actually get to meet Mother Teresa. This wasn't kind of some sort of buzzfeed clickbait thing. I did get to meet Mother Teresa. I met her in 1992. Uh, it's a remarkable story for me. I mean, I'm hoping it will uh, say something to you. I'm going to save what she taught me to the end, but she kind of taught me a couple of things. One was about customer experience, actually, and the other thing was about values. And I'm going to, sort of, I'm going to finish off my talk talking about what she had to say. Is that okay? So I'm going to let some suspense build up. You're all here for Mother Teresa, not for me. She's kind of like, she's like the Elon Musk of my kind of industry, and so people normally want to hear from her. So I'm going to leave her to the end. Yeah. Although she's not a big talker, and she was very little. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, really little. Um, so we're from Alight. I've got a couple of my colleagues here, and welcome everybody that's on um, the web uh, watching in. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about... Um, how we think about a few things, and I'm hoping these things are relevant for you. Yep. So to give you a little bit of an idea of who we are, where, as Caitlin said, we're a humanitarian organization, and we're focused on people that are displaced by conflict and by disaster. So we work a lot with refugees, with migrants, with any people that are forced to be on the move. Yep. And so we have over 2,500 staff that are based in these countries. We're actually headquartered here in Minneapolis, down near Certix, you know, in the uh, northeast. But our offices, and this is one of our smallest offices, we have our offices in these 16 countries. So we're in all of the garden spots. You know, these are the Paris, London, New York, Rome of my kind of world. It's Mexico, El Salvador, Colombia, Germany, Jordan, Syria, Sudan. You've probably been to holidays. Most of you have been to all these places, yes, <laughs> different times. Syria, South Sudan, DRC, that's Congo, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, Somalia, Pakistan, Myanmar, Thailand you may have been to. Yeah, there's a lot of refugees on the border of Thailand uh, with uh, Burma next door. So we work in those places and we have our teams located in those spots. So one way to think about us is we're like a nonprofit on steroids. Yep, or we're like, uh, you know, I think there used to be the extreme games. Do the extreme games still happen? Yeah, so in the nonprofit world, we're like the Extreme Games, a version of that. So we work in places like this. So you know, and I'm going to tell you some things through this talk. And sometimes when I say it, people think I'm a little bit naive. And so I like to like show you, this is where we hang. Yep. This is where our teams are from. For me personally, I've worked, um, I think, in most of the wars and most of the disasters for the last 20 years or 25 years. So I was an aid worker. I worked my way up through the ranks, if you like. I started my career in Papua New Guinea. A lot of people have been to Papua New Guinea here. Yeah. I'm an Australian, actually. A surprising number of Australians hang out in Papua New Guinea. The bad ones. I think it's like Alaska uh, for us. Yep. That's where you go and change your name and all that kind of business. But I was there for, on legit things. But I started in Papua New Guinea, but I've worked as an aid worker in places like Uganda during the Lord's Resistance Army, in Sierra Leone during the RUF. I was in Afghanistan after 9-11. I was working on the um, East Asia tsunami in 2005. We work in places like Darfur. Uh, I was in Haiti after the earthquake. So I've been in many of these locations and actually spent my whole career in these kinds of places. And we have team members now that work in all of those spots. So what are the kinds of things that we do? Um, we actually build and we run refugee settlements. So I'm going to give you some numbers. There's only a couple of numbers that actually I want you to remember, right? This one, you could remember this one. It's a useful number. It doesn't, I don't know if it means much, actually. But there are 25 million refugees in the world. Now, the problem with the number 25 million is that it sounds like a lot. And if you're one of the 25 million, it's a lot. But actually, compared to the whole world, it's a much smaller number than we think. Yep, 25 million. But a refugee is somebody that's, that's been persecuted, under attack, fears for their life, and they've run, and they've had to cross a border into a new country. So when they cross the border into the new country, they meet people like us in the United Nations. They get interviewed, and if everybody agrees, yes, you're from there, you were at risk, your life was at risk, you've had to flee, you've come into this new country, we're going to give you refugee status. Yeah? And then you're protected by international law. So there's like 25 million of those people. About a third of those live in refugee camps, like the one that you're seeing here. This is the Mahama... I was actually in this camp just two weeks ago. This is the Mahama refugee settlement 
in Rwanda. It's on the border of Tanzania. We actually built this camp. Now, if you went to this camp now, it's actually all houses and there's 65,000 people living in it. This was taken about three months after the refugees arrived and we built all of this. So these are all tents. You can't see the roads. There's actually two elementary schools in here. There's a clinic. There's two clinics, actually. There's a whole bunch of stuff in life that has to go on when you have 65,000 people in a place like this. We built this, and the way this kind of works is we get a telephone call from the United Nations saying we're expecting a large influx of refugees. These folks were from Burundi, and it was because of election violence. And we get a call from the UN. There's going to be a big influx of people coming in. We expect them all to arrive in six weeks' time. We're allocating this plot of land in the middle of nowhere. Can you send your team out there and build a city in preparation for the first 25,000 people to arrive. And so our team built all of that using hose, actually no bulldozers or any of that stuff. They built it all using shovels and tents and they built um, the water systems. You have to provide clean water to these people every day, so you've got to find water actually and then pump it in and make it all available. You've got to find a location where you can provide food. You have to build schools and all of this initially using tents. And then over time, you like evolve that into a more permanent place. So now if you visited there, it would look much more permanent. So we do these. Anybody know how large the largest refugee camp in the world is? You think, oh, really? I got that everybody would know this, right? The largest refugee camp in the world has 675,000 people living in it. It's in Bangladesh and it's for the Rohingya. And that camp went from nobody, or actually it was about 25,000 people, to over 600,000 people in about two months. And the entire settlement is built with bamboo. There are 200,000 bamboo dwellings. The houses, the school, everything is made of bamboo. This was built about a year or so ago. And at the time when it was being built, the entire global market for bamboo was wiped out wiped out because of building the city. 675,000 people in the world's largest bamboo city and it still exists like this in Bangladesh. Um, that's the world's biggest one. We built in that, uh, in, those, in that environment shelters and clean water. Another thing we do is we provide health care. This is probably closer to home to you. So we treat in our medical facilities around the world 1.2 million patients every year. And now this is an example of a, a clinic that we run in Eastern Congo. This is the one that Caitlin talked about that you guys actually helped us build. This is in Eastern Congo. But we also run medical facilities in Somalia. We run them in the Sudan. We run them in South Sudan. Our health teams in Burma, actually we have mobile health teams because the Rohingya are um, um, uh, experiencing so many difficulties, it's so hard to find them that our, we have to send health teams in boats up rivers. They travel about 12 hours in little groups of six, two doctors, two nurses, a nutritionist, hygienist, and a water person. They go up boats for 12 hours. They then march and hike into jungles to find these people. They then live with them for a week, treat all of their conditions, and then hike back out. And then next week they go and do it again somewhere else. Um, so those are the folks, some of the folks included in our 1.2 million. Otherwise, we run things like hospitals in South Sudan or in um, Darfur. We provide a lot of clean water. This, this is, again, is a Congo picture. It's a good picture, right? Um, we deliver every day about 7 million gallons of clean water to people. So we have water points on the streets of Mogadishu. If you're living in a large refugee camp with 100,000 people, you'll see a picture of one in a moment where we, you, know, we, you have to deliver clean water every single day. We're talking about millions of, of liters of water. And we have to do that seven days a week. And sometimes we do that in jungles, in deserts. And part of the challenge for us is how do you find this water in the first place, right? And then how do you provide it in a reliable way? So we do a lot of clean water and sanitation. We also build toilets by the thousands. We're like the toilet king and queens of these kinds of places. Um, that's a harder thing to do than you might think. Actually, the hard thing is not building the toilets. The hard thing is keeping the toilets clean. Yep, that's the hard bit. We also protect the vulnerable in these kinds of settings. So most people, and I think, sometimes I think we forget this idea that if you're a refugee, most people 
have only been... This is the first time they've ever been a refugee, or it's the first time they've been in a war. So this is a picture of a Syrian lady. When Syria devolved into its kind of war, you had to not only... Um, when you talk about... We talk about protecting people. We were, in that instance, for example, having, having to train families on how to take their children to school and avoid sniper fire, because the children were being shot at as they were on their way to school. So how do you do that? Like step number one, don't go the same way every single day. There are some, like, some you know, simple things that you can do. But we also, if you're in a large refugee camp, they're like large cities, and so we run shelters for women that have experienced domestic violence. We actually have lawyers that work in refugee camps that when domestic violence happens, they help take go to the police and they prosecute the people that are engaged in that. And we also do education on stopping forced marriage, stopping early marriage, childhood, child marriage. So we also engage in cultural practices on this. Another really uh, interesting and important thing that we do in this area is we actually work with LGBTQ refugees. Now, I'm guessing that's not a subject that you thought about, right? You think, like, it's just bad to be a refugee, right? And it's true. In, in many countries, it's hard to be a refugee. And actually, in many countries, it's hard to be gay. In every single instance, it's hard to be a gay refugee. So imagine if you're a trans-Iraqi refugee and you're living in a refugee settlement in Turkey. What do you think life is like? It's about as bad as a life could be. I was just in Nairobi working. There are 300 LGBTQ refugees there that had their safe houses burned down by other refugees and they were forced out of a refugee camp and they were living on the streets of Nairobi. The LGBTQ are the only refugees that other refugees want to kill. Yep, normally you're protected within your own little communities. So we've been asking this question, how do we protect um, trans refugees? That's a fun one. If you're interested in that subject, come and ask me because uh, we're, like, we're trying to get people involved because it's actually a really tough one. We educate girls and youth in different places. This is a picture of Pakistan. Right now, we've set ourselves a goal to put a million out-of-school youth uh, into school. We're, um, in last year, we put in 675,000 kids into schools in um, Pakistan. This year, we're hoping to hit the million. Uh, those are some sweeties in a school um, in Pakistan. We also do education in Somalia. Do you know that um, last year, that Somalia is taking in refugees from Yemen? So in Somalia right now, we're doing education of Yemeni refugees in Mogadishu. Like, you're getting your head... Like, how bad has it got to be if where you go for safety is Somalia? Yeah? The Yemenis, like, cross over, they're like, thank goodness we're in Somalia now, right? So that's a tough one, so we do education for the, the Yemenis in Mogadishu. And we also try to create economic and livelihood opportunities. This is a child in a coding school. We actually run a number of coding schools in refugee settlements because you can get piecemeal work no matter where you are in the world as long as you've got access to the internet. So we're training young people on some basic coding so that they can get um, commissioned work that way. So then we were asking this larger question, though. So I, I'm going to come back to this. So I, I wanna, this is an important number for you. Because there's a lot of stuff going on. We're going to talk about this in a moment. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world about refugees and migrants. And a lot of fear that's being induced. So I want to talk for a moment about this number of 25 million refugees. You know, are you all familiar with the, you know, the monk, that, you know, the painter that does the scream? Are you all like that? So like 10 years ago when I used to bring up refugees, people would always look at me and they would go all compassionate in their face. I'd say, what, you know, what do you, how do you feel about refugees? All compassionate. I feel so much compassion, but they're so far away, I don't see how it really connects to me. That was the most typical thing I got 10 years ago. If I was talking to like you guys 10 years ago, and I brought up refugees, compassion, but a long way away. Nowadays, I bring up refugees. What do you think I get instead of compassion? Anyone got any ideas? I gave you a hint at the painting. Fear. And instead of distance, instead of a long way away, what do you think people think now? They're in Rochester. They're marching on us, right? So what we have now is instead of compassion and distance, we have fear and proximity. I think everybody thinks like, hold on a second, if we just wait a couple of minutes, 
a thousand refugees will just come walking past that window, right? So here's the truth. In 2018, you can Google this, so it must be true, right? So what I'm telling you, and I'm like, I'm respectable. Um, so in 2018, obviously like there's 25 million refugees. What then happens is, you know, they're not meant to stay in camps their whole life. Actually, they end up spending about 17 years there. They end up spending their whole life there. But anyway, so there's 25 million. They go through all these interviews and all these checks, right? Interviews, checks, all this business. It takes about two years. And then they go through this process, and then they're deemed eligible for what's called third country repatriation or resettlement. So when a refugee comes to Minneapolis, for example, they're one of those people. Or when you hear about them going to Canada or the, or, um, the UK or anywhere else, they're one of those 1.2 million. So there's 25 million all arrive. There's a whole big interview process. And 1.2 million people sort of get through all these interviews. And they're like waiting now in their home to get an air ticket and told, good news, you're going to London. Good news, you're going to Berlin. Good news, you're going to Toronto, right? They're all waiting. So in 2000, and uh, you were 25 million, 1.2 million. So, and I'm not going to ask this number because last night I got just such a tough answer back. You like ruined it for me. Right, but I was going to say, so I want you just to think in your head because I don't want you to like pull the rug out from under me. But of that 1.2 million in 2018, how many do you think got sent somewhere else, anywhere in the world? I don't want you to answer that because you're gonna, some of you are like far too cynical. But I want you to think, out of 1.2 million, how many do you think? Uh-oh, here's the, someone wants to answer. 100, good, well done, high five. 180,000, good answer. Seems like a reasonable answer to me. Sorry, sir, bah, wrong. But you're brave. 50,000 people got resettled. So again, uh, 1.2 million people. 50,000 got settled anywhere in the whole world. That's not the US. That's anywhere in the whole world. So here's my question for you. Are the refugees invading us? No. No. Are there going to be 1,000 refugees? No. There's probably been maybe even one or two refugees in the room. I hope there is. But no, they're not invading us. In fact, if you're a refugee today and you get resettled, that's like winning the Powerball lottery. I think globally, if you looked up how many people win the lottery every year, I think 50,000 is a pretty good number. I'm guessing it's about the same as winning the lottery. So in other words, it's not a real thing. So when we talk about a refugee crisis, right, sometimes I feel like when we bring up refugee crisis and we're all talking about it, the refugees are sitting there going, Why are you making this about you? We are in the crisis. You're somehow making this story about you. It's not crisis for us. So I can just say it categorically. There is no refugee crisis. Actually, there's no global people movement crisis. Unless you're one of those people, then it's a crisis. You end up spending 17 years or your whole life living in a camp like the one I just showed you. So we were asking this question of ourselves how do you then, and I think you guys have been asking this, right? So in, you see so much disruption occurring around us in so many sectors and so many industries. What would happen if somebody tried to disrupt the social sector? What if you tried to create a radically transformative life for a refugee, even if they could never leave a camp? What would that look like? How could you work in a place like El Salvador that's roiled with so much violence and forcing so many people to leave? How could you work in a place like that with communities in such a way that the communities don't need to move, that they can actually bring up their children in safety and have a great life? So we were asking this question, like, what would it look like to disrupt ourselves? And I think you guys are asking similar questions all the time, right? So we just asked this. I know these are all cliches, but you get what I mean, right? And the fact is, you know there's none in the social sector because if, if there is somebody, you always know it. Right? If you ask every industry, who's the disruptor? Oh, it's so-and-so, oh, it's so-and-so. These are all household names. The fact that if I ask you who is the disruptor in the nonprofit or the social industry and you don't know who that is, that means it hasn't happened yet. We're all still locked in this kind of 20th century way of working. I've, I've been doing this work for almost 25 years now. I can tell you that what we do in a refugee camp today 
is basically exactly the same as what we did 25 years ago. And if I brought somebody that was there in the 1960s, they would feel perfectly at home. So I'm going to just give you three examples of things that we do. So the first thing is this, and, I, and I'm, all three of these are going to sound far too simple for you. But what I'm, what I'm hoping that I've, you've picked up from me is actually we do hard things. We do very hard things. Like, do you, do you have teams that are kidnapped? Do you worry about UHG staff being bombed? Do you have your UHG teams working in a curfew so that when the sun rises and when the sun sets, they have to be back in their homes because it's too dangerous to be out when it's dark? So that's, that's where we work. Yeah? And yet at the same time, we're trying to produce some level of transformative change. And we have to do practical things. We have to treat patients. We have to deliver clean water. We have to run schools in those kinds of places. So what do we do? First thing we do is we do the doable. I'm going to give you a story related to that. Actually, two quick ones. So the first one is this. So we, we talk about this idea. In the face of the impossible, and sometimes for us it feels like it's impossible, yeah, what can you do? And in the end, after 20-something years of doing all that, we've just said, you can just, you've got to be able to do something. So we actually learned this in one example. It was with this team. This team's in a refugee settlement in Uganda. The refugee settlement was started in 1958. It's one of the oldest refugee settlements in the world, 60 years old. In that settlement, there's something like 12 nationalities. There's more than 10 different languages spoken in one little place. There's 100,000 people living there. At that time, we were delivering clean water, nutrition, and a whole bunch of different things. And a colleague, and this team was actually mutinying, like melting down, right, in crisis. And so we sent out one of our, uh, she's actually our chief operating officer now, we sent her out there to like talk to this team. There was 35 of them actually. So she drives there. This camp's in the middle of nowhere in Uganda. And she visits this team, sits down with them, and they're all crying. She goes, and they're like, they're very upset, right? So she goes, why are you all crying? Why are you upset? And they're like, well, we're delivering clean water. We do all these services. But the truth is our services are rubbish. Our water is not good enough. Some days we don't even open our water points. People have nothing to drink. Our food, we give exactly the same food every day for years on end. I mean it literally. It's beans, right? It's the same food every single day. And they said we get abused and we get harangued by the refugees and they complain all the time. And it's got to the point where when we walk, because they live in the refugee settlement, when they walk from their homes to the office, they have to like hide the logo, right? They're just another refugee. Yep. Because they get accosted. And so they were like, we have to do something. You've got to fix this. And so she said, okay, break into teams and I want you to, to work on how to fix it. And they said, we don't need to do that. We actually know the answer to this. We need to fix the water system. We need to redo the clinic. We need to re... How much will all that cost? $2 million and the problem solved. So she sat there and thought about it for a moment. And she said, okay, hmm. I have good news and I have bad news. Which do you want first? The bad news. Okay, here's the bad news is we don't have $2 million. That's never going to happen. No. Well, what's the good news? So she actually had her purse. She pulled out her purse and she said, well, I have my per diem. And she pulled it out and she counted it. And it was $500. And she said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to give you the $500 right now. And if you guys can come up with a good idea, we'll go and spend it today on at least making something better. And so that team broke off. They used this. If you know human-centered design, we're like poster kings and queens, right? So they used all the posters. They came up, they came up with something like 243 ideas in one hour that they could use for $500. And that, they picked one, and they went out and did that idea that day. This was how long ago, Chris, was this? About two and a half years? This happened for us about two and a half, three years ago. We have since that day now done one $500 thing every single day. And our teams are trained around the world. When it's something's impossible, when it costs a million dollars, we'll give you $500 as long as you can do something now. So I'll give you one example of this. This is Sonia. 
So Sonia was working in a place called Bidi Bidi Refugee Settlement. Am I giving you too much detail? Is this going okay? Yeah. So Bidi Bidi Refugee Settlement was South Sudanese people in northern Uganda. It had 275,000 refugees that had crossed over the border. They were typically walking about two weeks from conflict. They were walking through jungles and far everything. Tough. And, and, and Sonia was our protection officer. So protection officers, and you go to a place called a reception center. So when refugees walk for two weeks, the first place they come to is like a reception area. And you sort of register, you give your name, you, you do all that stuff, and you get immediately issued some things like um, some stuff. Because you, when you walk two weeks, you lose everything. So you just turn up like this, carrying a child typically. And, our protect, and then we, they, they provide them like hot, hot food. So our protection teams line up with the people lined up. Because if you want to make sure you talk to everybody, go where the food is, right? So Sonia just walks up and down the line. And her job is to find the orphans, the disabled people, the widows, anyone with the particular things that make them especially vulnerable and that they need a special care as soon as they've arrived. Very sick, for example. She looks for those people. So she's walking up and down the line. But she notices something happening at the front of the line. There's a man there. He's talking to the person who's, like, you know, dealing with food. They go backwards and forwards. The guy takes his boot off. He's got an old gum boot, rubber gum boot. He uses a knife, he cuts the gum boot down to the shoe. He hands the shoe to the guy serving up the food. The guy with a pours in the beans into the boot and some rice. And this guy walks off with the shoe. And um, Sonia runs up to him. And she says, what on earth just happened? Why on earth have you got beans and rice in your boot? Like he's hobbling, he's barefoot now. And he said, I've walked for two weeks. I've got nothing. I'm starving. I need to eat. I got to the front of the line. The person at the front of the line said, do you have a plate? I said, I don't have a plate. And he said, well, you're going to have to go and find one before I can serve you up. And he said, I have my shoes. Hold on a second. And he cut his boot open, and he used his boot for his food. And Sonia said, this is absolutely an unacceptable thing. So she knew she had $500 if she could do the doable. So she went out and she bought all of these plates, and what she created is a lending library. So now on that line, next to that line, there's a lending library, right? If you don't have a plate, you can borrow a cup and you can borrow one of these plates. You can get your first meal, and then two or three days later, when you get issued those things by the UN, you can then hand these things back to us. And we still run this lending library. It costs $500, and it stops that kind of indignity that happens. So in the face of the impossible, what we always try to do is do the doable. For us, this has been the secret to unlocking a remarkable amount of things. Second thing we do is when you have so, when it's, when everything seems so overwhelming and so difficult, so morally challenging all the time, like why should a person be treated that way? It's appalling, you yeah? know? So we have a mantra, this is one of our values, to bravely be better. And so rather than always trying to be the best, what we just always try to do is we just try to do a better thing every day. And here's the good thing about this idea. If I was to say to you on almost, in almost every area of your life, what's the best thing? What happens? You get like, oh, it's powerless. Who knows what the best thing is? Who knows what the best thing is? And here's the other truth. Some of the worst things that have ever been done to humanity were done because somebody thought they were the, the best thing. So instead, what we try to do is the better thing. And you know what the good thing about the better thing is? No one ever has trouble with the better thing. Is that the better thing? No. OK, just go and do the better thing. OK. This one's so easy. And nothing ever bad ever happens when you try to do a better thing. It's like uncanny how this thing works. So we just have this as like a thing. Are we doing the better thing? OK. So here's an example. We decided, and this is, we're getting to your customer experience. Don't worry, we're getting there. We were decided at one point, we were like, we're thinking about refugees. I think we're thinking about them all wrong. Yep. Like, what if we thought about them like they were customers? And then we used to spend years. I did my master's degree. We used to spend years thinking, how do you know if you're doing a good job? How do you know if you're having an impact? How do you know where you're having an impact? I'm guessing you guys have a lot of indicators and a lot of KPIs, right? 
in my industry, we are like drowning in them. Under five this, under 12 month that, percentage change this, malnutrition, all these statistics, all these outcomes, all these things. You know, in one, one grant I get from the US government to run healthcare in Darfur, I have 10 indicators, I have to collect 140 data points to provide those 10 indicators. We're drowning in this stuff, yep. So you know what we thought we would do? Is we thought, why don't we just like ask a refugee if we're doing a good job? So now what we do, is we only have one indicator in our organization now. So when a refugee goes to a water point or when they go to our clinic or they go to one of our schools, when they walk out, there's another refugee standing there with a device like this. Actually, it looks like sh there she's doing it. And we just say to the refugee, did we do a good thing or not? And they just slide this thing across. That's a, it's an app. They just slide it, smiley face or frowny face. Man, this has been like the greatest revolution I have ever seen. It turns out like humans are like a supercomputer somehow. Like we try to have like 50 indicators that we can all tie together to tell us if a thing happens. It turns out like one human brain can like assimilate all of the information they're getting and they can just spit out. Have you ever seen The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? It's like that super, it turns out like the human brain is like that. Yes, I liked it. And it, when we're analyzing this now, they're normally like right about it. Like when they say it's bad, what we've discovered is this was bad. Yep. And when they go it's good, we go there, actually this is pretty good. Like it's surprisingly how well it works. And then when they go it's bad and then you fix it, they go, now it's good. And you're like, we just fixed it. And we could see in one week a change. We just made progress, high five. It turns out this like works, yep. And, and when I told my board, because we put this on a website, you can actually go to our website and it's kujakuja.com. You can look today all the way down to an individual clinic or a tap and see what the refugees thought about us. It's fully transparent. Now you can imagine when I told my teams and my board, I come up with this idea, right? Like Uber lets you like rate them, and that's like a taxi service. We're gonna let the refugees rate us. All blood runs from faces in the room. And then I go, that's not even the good bit, right? The good bit is we're gonna put it on a website and the whole world is gonna see it. There's like banging noises as my board literally fainted and fell onto the ground. They're like, oh my God, that's the end of us. I go, they go, what if it's all red? And I go, okay, let's just back down. That would totally suck if it was all red and like we all should be panicking and shame on us, we should fix it. But don't worry, it won't be red. We're just basically mediocre. So it's probably gonna be like 60-40. Yeah, it turns out it's always 60-40 when we do it. Because refugees are nice. They go, we know you're working your best. We'll give you like 60, yeah. So we do this thing. This is so powerful for us. And we ask two questions. And the second question, we did it by accident. Because initially we were just like, no, you just rate, good or bad. But what would happen is the refugees were like, no one's ever asked me my opinion before. So the first time you asked them, they were like, you can't go anywhere. And they would spend 45 minutes talking to us. Now that I got you, and now you're listening to me, I got a whole, let me just pull out my notebook, right? I got all these things, it took 45 minutes. So the team was like, we need to have a second question so that it looks like we're typing something in when they're telling us all this stuff. Otherwise we're like, yeah, I'm, I'm remembering. Right? So we asked a second question. What idea do you have to make us better? This one's even better. We now have over 900,000 ideas from refugees around the world. And these ideas are like remarkable. And I'm going to tell you the best one in the next bit. But these, we use these ideas every day now. We have to use natural language learning out of Stanford University because we get so many ideas. And these, we had one idea in one water point once. The idea was stop letting the pretty girls cut in line. It's making the wait too long. We go out there, are you guys like letting the pretty girls? Yeah, we're letting the pretty girls cut in line. <laughs> Can you stop letting the pretty, okay, we'll stop letting the pretty girls. And that line gets fixed. Another one was like the pharmacist. It's taking hours. What's the idea? Tell him to talk less, right? Are you talking like, yeah, I'm asking people how their day is and st stop that, right? So there's like very simple ideas, but also some really big ones. And I'm gonna tell you a big one in a moment. 
So that idea one worked out really well. And we put it on the website. So that was from one day. That was like last week. So right now, see where? Look, we're exactly at 60%. That's our global stats. And we picked them up for Somalia. And if you drill down, you'd see everything else. So, and then like the last bit is unleashing abundance. So um, I'll say this. The world is much better than you think. So if I leave you with nothing, it's this. If, who, do I have an excuse to be a cynical, scarcity-oriented person? Like, you work for one of the world's largest corporations. You're all having a great time. You have your own cafeteria. You live in Minnesota. Like, life's pretty good, yeah? Now, I can't speak about you personally, but I mean at the aggregate. We work in Mogadishu, Congo, Darfur, El Salvador. We work in those places. I've personally worked in those places for 25 years. Would you agree these are the places that are defined by, like, if you looked up the dictionary word for scarcity, where is it scarce? Would our list of countries like come up? Yes. So I'm telling you, this is, this is, if I've learned anything in my 25 years, it is that the world is much better than you think. It is much more abundant than you think. And for some reason, we're getting ourselves in knots. We're thinking that the world is scarce, that there isn't enough place and, and time and uh, earth, and there isn't enough of all this stuff, and we all have to like panic. But the truth is the world is enormous, and it's beautiful, and it's full of remarkable people. And there are so many opportunities that would blow your mind. And that's true for us. We have so many opportunities we can't keep up with it, like 900,000 ideas, for example. And we work in what people think are the hardest places. So what we've done is, this is back to Mahama, we, we now look to refugee camps and we think these are surely abundant, beautiful places. And so here's the example of the best idea we ever had, and then I'm going to um, close with Mother Teresa and open it up for questions. So we go out every day with Kuja Kuja, we're, you know, remember we're collecting this, and then we're asking what idea. And at one of these water points, the, you know, this lady, her name's Mary, She's a political asylum seeker. She's from Kenya and she lives in Uganda. She was um, collecting the data and there was a little boy that was at the water point. Not this little boy, but you get the picture. And he'd been watching her and he walked up to her one day and he said, um, you come here every day and you ask everybody for their ideas and you've never asked me for my idea. And I have an idea and I want to tell it to you. And she's like, cool, great. Like, what's your idea? And he says, you open your water points every day at 7.30. So we all have to all go and collect the water and come back. It takes about half an hour to an hour to collect all the water. He said, but our school starts at 8 o'clock in the morning. So because you start at 7.30, by the time our mother collects the water, we have to go to school. And so we never have breakfast. I've never had breakfast. If you just open the water points an hour earlier at 6.30 in the morning, then the whole camp could get their water early and 25,000 children would have breakfast. This camp is 60 years old. And we were like, so it took us 60 years to realize this, that no one's having breakfast. And this seven-year-old boy is the one that's like, hello. So it turns out, of all the 900,000 ideas, and so of course, we move the water. Everybody has breakfast now, right? That's the best idea we got. And it came from a child. Now, and so I'm, I'm just saying, and that was one seven-year-old. Now we're like, everybody, fan out. Find all the seven-year-olds, right? <laughs> and then they're like, what about the eight and nine-year-olds? We're like, we're going to have to hire more people. So when you go, how abundant is it? I'm saying we're overwhelmed just getting ideas from seven, eight, and nine-year-olds, right? We still got everybody else in the camp. Yep. The world is so abundant. There is so much of every single thing if you just go and look for it. Yeah. The world's much better than you think. And we've created a values book to help guide us. And this is where Mother Teresa taught me a lesson. It's always, I'm always reminded, you know when you get on a Delta flight and they tell you in the beginning of the flight what their values are? I'm always, I always sit there and I think, you're a little bit late for that. <laughs> right? You don't have to tell me your values. I'm frankly right now living them. 
So what happened? I visited Mother Teresa. Yeah? And I'd, Mother Teresa is like a hero for me. And I spent years studying her and thinking about her. And one day I decided I was going to go and stand near her. This is 1992. I was a small boy. Yeah, not that small. But I was a small boy. And so I went over to Calcutta, and I managed to find out where Mother Teresa lives. And I went and I stood on the steps, and I thought, this can't be it, because it looks, this is not, this is another place. I'm going to tell you about called Calicut. But where she lives, just like this sort of nondescript building, and it had a little door. And it was like, I thought, this, surely this can't be where Mother Teresa lives. It had a little hand-painted sign. You can also Google this, Mother Teresa's door, and you can actually see it. There's a little hand-painted sign. It's white, Mother Teresa, right? That's it. So I thought, this can't be Mother Teresa's place. So there's a little a bell, the chain. So I rang the chain. Um, and then a sister comes to the door, and I said, I just, like, I, I just want to stand near Mother Teresa, but I can't believe she's actually, this is where she lives. And the sister's like, yeah, no, this is like where Mother Teresa lives. So I said, okay, do you mind if I just stand here on the steps for two hours? And the sister's like, wait, what? You're going to, like, stand on the steps? For I go, yeah, I've flown all the way here to Calcutta. I want to stand near where Mother Teresa lives. She says, well, like, the mother's, like, here. <laughs> and I... I like panic, right? Mother Teresa's here. That's even better. Like I'm going to stand here for two hours, and she's going to be like just up the steps. And she's like, you don't have to be like weird like this. Like you can just <laughs> come up the steps and just say hello. I, I can say hello to Mother Teresa. Yeah, she'll like yeah, of course. Like what's your sure? Like so I walk up the stairs. They say sit down here. I sit down there. Two minutes later, Mother Teresa walks out of her bedroom, right? And she walks up, and she's like this. And I'm like, I'm like seeing a boy, but I'm like the fan of like Justin Bieber, right? Just comes out. I'm like sweating, crying. And she's like, take it easy. Take a seat. You're going to collapse. So I sit down. And she's like, why are you here? And I said, I just want to be near you. And she said, well, you're going about it all wrong. She's not mean like this. She didn't really say it like this. She said it in a much nicer way. But this is what she meant. You're doing this all wrong, guy. If you want to know me, this is not how you get to know me. You need to go and spend time in color cut. Which is that? Which, this is the home for the dying that she founded, the first one in Calcutta. She said, if you want to understand me, how long are you here in Calcutta? Three days. OK, you need to spend three days then with the people in Calicut, and then you'll know who I am. So she called over one of the sisters and said, take him, set him up to go to Calicut. And then she said nice things to me, and then, you know, let me go. So I went down to Calicut the next day. I knock on the door, that door. And I'm like in eight in the morning or something. And, I, and this door opens and the sister's standing there. And I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I know like the boss has called you up. She said, you have to take this like random guy in. And I'm like blubbering again like this. And she's like, what? You're being like totally weird. <laughs> yep. Like you're here to hang out with us. Yes, with the, uh, yeah. So they bring me in. And they're like, you see that man lying there? He's lying there. And he's like a skeleton. He's very sick. He's dying. This is, it's for a home for dying people. And uh, she says, um, he's going to be your friend for the next three days. I go, OK. like. How do I, like, what, what should I do? And she's like, well, you could just see that stool next to him. Just sit there, hold his hand, and talk to him. And I, OK, OK. Then what? And she's like, that's pretty much it. I mean, if he needs to go to the toilet, you should take him. If he needs to get bathed, you should take him. And when it's lunchtime or dinner time, you can feed him. But otherwise, no. And I go, what do I do when I'm sitting there? She goes, you could just talk to him or sing to him. And then I'm like, oh, well, here's the thing. I don't speak Hindi, right? I don't even speak his language. He won't understand what I'm saying. And so she looks at me and she just says, it'll be OK. Yeah, just talk to him. He'll appreciate it. So I sat there for three days, talked to this guy, sang to this guy, did all of this stuff. Yeah. Now, what do I learn from that? About customer experience. Yeah. Two quick things. You don't have to talk about your values if you live your values. You don't need to. Did I learn more about Mother Teresa in that three days than I would have spending an hour interviewing her? Totally. Because she came and sat with other people while I was there. This is what she does, or did, every day. And secondly, what I learned above all other things was that in her mind, human beings are the most sacred, most wonderful, and the most enormous of all things. And that there is no greater privilege in life than the privilege of being with another human being 
and serving them. And even more deeply, when a human being comes to you in sickness and in suffering, and when you have the chance to give to that person, you're actually living in the most sacred moment that a human being gets to experience when one person needs and when another person gives. And that is like, and I mean this, that is actually a sacred moment. And so what I learned in those three days, was it took three days, was that actually to sit in it and in a sense worship in that space and to see this person, to like embrace them truly. And now with our organization, we try to do this with refugees. So I leave it to you. You guys have a special privilege. You work in healthcare every day. You actually work in a sacred place. And you get to live the same moment that I lived. Actually, you get to live every single day. And that's the lesson that Mother Teresa taught me about customer experience.